He's an author, filmmaker, screenwriter, and creator of the Shinjuku Shadows series. It's a mouthful. And the Ronin Trilogy, Hammer Falls, and uh, many other novels. His more than 30 short stories appear in Amazing Monster Tales, Apex Magazine, Tales to Terrify, and others. But his newest project is a horror comedy short film called Demon for Hire. Today, we're we are visited by Travis Heerman on Slasher Sports Cinema. <laughs> They will say that I have shed innocent blood. What's blood for if not for shedding? I'm the number one fan. We all go a little mad sometimes. Oh, it no fun here. They're coming to get you, Barbara. Sports show with Billy Gray. Welcome to the show, Travis. Thank you for uh, being on. Thank you, and and let me just say that intro kicks ass, buddy. I and mean, that's awesome. <laughs> you know, it is music to my ears. Literally, when when people say that, I always have to. Anytime somebody brings it up. Uh, I have to bring up Carl Casey from White Bat Audio. The guy's a badass, makes great music. That little uh, cyberpunk thing is, or I really dig it. The visuals, just sexy, it's dark. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we couldn't ask for a better intro, honestly. <laughs> For sure. And by the way, can I say ass on your on your uh, show? Uh, you can say ass. You can <laughs> say uh, anything that comes to mind. This is not. Um, I would like to say family friendly, but it is family friendly. Just a family that curses. Okay. So, all right. Good to know. Yeah. Now, Travis, for a very long time, there's been a funny hypothetical premise or question, I guess, floating around on the the social interwebs. Um, you know, it gets hilarious responses. And the scenario is pick a movie, keep one character, but replace the rest with Muppets. It's a wild visual, mm -hmm. but uh, you're not far off from doing that in your new short film, Demon for Hire. No, because the main character is a Muppet. <laughs> of course, I can't say Muppet because that's, you know, trademarked by Disney, but of everybody course. knows. So, of course. But. I mean that that's what it is. We we know that there there are puppets, you know, all, all over but you see a specific style and Muppet just comes to mind because mm -hmm. the, the the visuals there. But you you're right. We'll we'll keep it we'll, we'll keep you out of litigation <laughs> and uh, we'll we'll say uh you need to coin a new term is what you need to do. Right, right. Uh I don't know, horror puppet uh puppets, I don't know, something. Yeah, the puppets. <laughs> okay, so the Huppets, uh, the, the Huppet that you have here, uh, I believe his name is Sully. Yep. Who does the voice for Sully? Uh, got a puppeteer uh, named Thompson Powers. <clears throat> uh, and he is just fantastic. He made that character come to life. Uh, I'm just super happy with that. You know, watching the trailer, I was very happy with it myself. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Do you mind if we take a look at the trailer? Sure, go ahead. Let's get it. It's a rough job corrupting mortals, especially nowadays. I'm Sully, demon for hire. The Huppet himself. I'm not sure I'm in the right place. Relax. I'm not gonna... and, and, and who's this? Oh, well, our, our main actress. A little, uh, a uh, lady fine. named Savannah Mortensen. News, um, and she news, is also awesome. Really, I am. Really I cannot say enough good things about her. Like this, I could smell a succubus far three dimensions away. And was there a uh, like a casting call, or was this like a, a personal acquaintance that you knew? No, so, I had a I had a casting call. I, um, I used a I used Check a website that uh, does such things Grandma? and interviewed. Are you okay? I don't know, this Thirty plus emergency. actors. Uh, what the hell? For all the different characters, and and uh, that's how we got our cast. Rancid, radioactive, roadkill. She's doing a great job here. Flags for you. I love the dialogue already. 
it would be hypocritical of me to fault her culinary predilections. <laughs> oh, that's not right. <laughs> so what do we do? I'm looking forward to this, Travis. I really am. Thanks. Um, are you in the Chicago area? I'm not. I'm in the Nashville, Tennessee area. Okay. So at least the same time zone. Uh, uh, there are film festivals in the Nashville area that I am going to submit to. Um, I haven't done it yet because they're not currently open. Um, but uh, maybe it will be coming to your neck of the woods. And, and if it does, I'm there. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. So let, let's take it back to, I, I guess, the beginning of the filmmaking venture, because it wasn't always your, your bag. Um, I guess we should start with the premise of the, the idea of, of starting your production studio, Bear Paw Films. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, I've been wanting to get into screenwriting for, oh, I don't know, 13 or 14 years, probably. I think I wrote my first script and starting in about 08, 09 uh, with a friend of mine, uh, Jim Pinto. Um, and, uh, you know, and had some scripts, I've been sending them out, but then, you know, it, it's one of those filmmaking is, uh, I could, is one of those things. It's incredibly complicated. It requires, um, uh, you know, people, it requires people, uh, like it's a major collaborative effort. Uh, there's so many moving parts. Um, but it's always something that I've wanted to do. And, um, Ooh, are we getting a, like a weird video thing here? Am I flickering? No, I, I see you. I see you well. Okay. All right. Cool. Must be on my end. All right. So, uh, you know, sitting around stuck in my house in the middle of the pandemic, um, uh, I, I, I just had this moment of what am I waiting for? Just do it. Um, make something. Um, cause, uh, a few years ago, uh, I went to a festival called genre blast, uh, which is in Virginia. Great. It's a great event. Um, the people that run it really do a, a, a quality, uh, weekend. Um, and, uh, one of the, and I had submitted a, a feature script out there and a short script also. Um, <clears throat> and, um, one of the judges came up to me or, uh, uh, sought me out uh, at near the beginning of the festival, uh, Sam Kolesnik. And, and she s said to me, you know, I'm one of the judges. Uh, you're a really good writer. Um, and what you should, what you need to do now is just make your movie, make a movie. It's going to suck. Uh, I can't remember if she said that, but that's sort of the implication is that just make your first movie, let it suck and get it out there. Um, so then you then have the experience, you have something to build on and so forth. Um, and I had been chewing on that for a good couple of years, um, uh, until I finally was sitting around that day in the middle of winter, like February of 2021 and just decided to do it. Uh, and then it became a matter of, of what kind of thing I would do. Um, what resources did I have? Um, that kind of thing. Uh, it was just, that was, that was the moment, uh, and it grew. Um, it became somewhat more than I was originally expecting, actually. It seems like that cabin fever really, really <laughs> contributed. Yeah. It, it, yeah. it contributed to a lot of creative outlets. Um, yeah, because I had been in such a creative wasteland since the, since the pandemic started. Um, and, uh, you know, I talk, I know a ton of writers, um, and we were all talking about it and some of them, you know, we're using this to create, we're using the, the societal cultural malaise that was going on uh, to create. And some of us were just like uh, smothered by it. Um, and this was kind of a, like a breakout moment for me to try and get out of that, you know? Well, well it put a lot of us in this mental bog mm -hmm. that it was almost surrealism. I and think to some degree it's still there. Um, uh, not nearly what it was, of course, but sure. You know, I just got over, uh, I just got over COVID a week ago, another bout. I had it before I've been vaccinated many times. Um, but 
you know, uh, I went to American Film Market in L.A. Um, and had that uh, sort of called off by COVID at the at the very outset. And um, uh, the, I think that malaise still exists. Um, people are sort of excited for this to be over. They want it to be over, but it's not quite over. <laughs> you know, it's still hanging on. Um, yeah. And uh, it's still affecting people, you know. It is. And I have a lot of friends who in, in the comedy business who basically just shut down operations said, you know what? I'm not going to a, to a comedy club where they're going to pay you and drink vouchers to, you know, to perform. And yeah, uh, yeah that, that James Alexander's getting the credit for that one. Uh, yeah. But it was, it was a clever statement, but it's 1000% true. Mm -hmm. I mean, is it's the, another uh, way of uh, getting paid and exposure, right? Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty and much. We, and, and we, and, and how many exposures does it take to pay the rent? Um, <laughs> yeah. Th you know? That's, that, that's the question, right? So, mm -hmm. I mean, he just stuck to his nine to five, which he gets to work from home and uh, myself as well. But I mean, it does shut down some of the, you know, the, the more creative ideas sometimes, unless mm -hmm. you can just put pen to paper, hypothetically, or, you know, theoretically, because we know that we're typing now, but it, it's, it's really, I feel like COVID is almost like that 9-11 moment. You know what, how life was prior to, you remember, or you know now how life is after, but it's kind of the marking of an era. It absolutely and, is. Yeah. It's and, a and generational it, signpost, right? It, there you go. Perfect. Perfectly said. Generational signpost. So you wrote and directed Demon for Hire. Where did you mm -hmm. get the idea? Well, on that same day, uh, I was, I just started looking around at what I had um, to work with. Um, and I had had this puppet for a long time. I had uh, gotten him for myself as kind of a, sort of treated him like a creative muse, although I never really sort of took full advantage of that. He was just always kind of sitting there and I'd break him out at a convention once in a while and, and, and play with him. But um so I had him and I just started sort of mashing ideas around. Um, and it didn't take long that I had this sort of idea of him as a private investigator and, and a demon. And, and I love like cosmic horror, the Lovecraftian sort of cosmic horror. And I wanted it to be something like that. And, and I just, my, my brain just sort of, uh, took off and and that was that was how it began originally uh i was thinking well i'm you know i i've i've got i've got an iphone and a gimbal i can shoot with that uh do something with that make just something right um but then um the further i got into it the more i wanted to do something that was more cinematic more i don't know high higher production value higher caliber um, and I knew a ton of filmmakers from the festivals I had gone to, um, and, uh, I started reaching out and lo and behold, uh, you know, I've got to hand it to, uh, my, the, the, the linchpin of my production crew, uh, which is, uh, Sophia Cacciola, my uh, director of photography and her husband, Michael J. Epstein, who together form a sort of mobile production studio or pr production company where they have the cameras, they have the audio, they have the lighting and they just show up. So I hired them and, uh, and, and they were excited to do it. And, you know, they read the script and uh, they had some feedback on the script about things we would be able to shoot and things and things like that. And, uh, and we sort of started building from there. Uh, what did hiring their mobile studio, so to speak, uh, do for your budget? Did, did that kind well, of help okay, you? Or? Yeah, there was a substantial cost to that. So that immediately required uh, basically a source of funding. So I, uh, I've done a bunch of Kickstarters in the past for various projects. So I did a crowdfunding campaign, and, and uh, that's how we got basically our production budget and uh, uh, some of our post-production expenses. Oh, and, and compared to a budget where um, 
I guess you didn't have this. I don't really know how to call it. Maybe like a um, just this package deal mm -hmm. with them. What, what, did they help you save money, or did they help you, or or did they? I guess I th well, I think the rate was pretty reasonable. They, they they offered me like a package rate for three days of shooting. Okay, um, uh, you know, based on the length of the script we had, we thought we could do it in a, in a, in a long weekend, so we did. Um, and uh, you know, they. They had a package rate. They brought an assistant, uh, like an assistant camera operator, along, um, and um, uh, that was. So you how shot it in three that, days. We shot it in three days. Gosh, Roger Corman over here. <laughs> well, you know, it's a twenty-minute movie. Um, sure. You know, and the sort of rule of thumb is, you know, the uh, is that you can shoot five pages of script in a day, um, and okay. uh, we had five like pages a, in a day. Yeah. So we had like a 16, 17 page script. Uh, and we thought we could kind of cram it into a couple, like some long days and it turned out, yeah, they were some pretty long days. Um, plus we were, you know, uh, it's a horror movie. So we were shooting in the dark and we ran out of nighttime a couple of times. So, of course, of course. Okay. So you were shooting on into the, uh, in the, the wee hours. Yeah. And this was over the summer. So the night was relatively short, you know, and we would like for the night stuff, we would start, sh we started shooting at about nine, at 9 PM. Um, and then the sun was by, by 6 AM, the sun was coming up. Um, and we were trying to hurry through the last few shots we could get. Um, because when it was, because we were uh, kind of up against the hard deadline of Michael and Sophia and Danielle having to fly back to LA, uh, for other projects. Uh, so, it was pretty, pretty crazy, <laughs> crazy, but it worked out. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you've already said that you had the, uh, you had the prop. So when you were writing, the idea was always the non-human character like Sully. Yes. Yes. Yeah. He, he was, he was going to be a puppet from the get go. So I just spoke to uh, a good friend, Lucky Saruti, who did a film called beast. Um, have you ever worked with uh, stop motion? Or have you ever thought about stop motion? No, this is my first film. The first film, period. Yeah. Okay, not just, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Well, he, um, the, the film that I saw, I could have sworn the puppet was stop motion. Could have sworn it. But the puppet was just, I mean, it was, it was hideous. <laughs> and it was beastly. And yeah, I always wondered about the, I guess the, the comparisons and the contrasts between working with stop motion and, and puppetry, but th that's good. So, okay. We, we talked about Savannah Mortensen already. You mm -hmm. did the cast and call. Um, and again, the voice of Sully is uh, Thompson powers. I don't know much about Thompson. Uh, he is a puppeteer from the Denver area. Um, so uh, not a voiceover guy. No, he's not a voiceover guy. Uh, he is a, he is part of like the local puppeteers organization. And that's how I found him. Uh, I had no idea that such a thing even existed uh, before I started this uh, casting process. Um, and, uh, you know, he, he also does a lot of improv comedy. Um, oh. And uh, so sort of letting him go at times was really great. Um, one of the things that we did for the crowdfunding campaign was that if, if you donated above a certain level, you got a personal video thank you from Sully. <clears throat> uh, so Thompson kind of used that, and, and most of the most of the people who donated were people I knew, or or they were like friends of friends. Uh, so uh, it was relatively easy for me to sort of give him a seed, and then he could sort of take that and improv on it. Um, and, th and those were just all hilarious. Uh, uh, and, and that was also kind of a testing bed for him to develop that character. Because uh, by the end of it, he had done like 70 of these 30 second to one minute videos. And so that by the time we started shooting, uh, he knew who that character was. Uh, and that was that was really great. Improv is a completely different monster when it comes to acting. But I love something draws me to a film when I know that a lot of the script is either loose or completely improv. There's a film. I talk about this a lot on the show. 
But Jim Burkett directed a film called Coherence. And that film, uh, very low budget, somehow just completely blew up in China. Uh, more of a, a more of a cult flick here. Uh, it's got a small following, but a dedicated following. You and say Burkett's it's called great, Coherence? Coherence. Okay. Uh, it's kind of a... Um, it's not under the horror banner, which is mostly what we talk about here, but it, it is still strange and unusual and Twilight Zone outer limits kind of situation going on. So that's still right up our alley. Mm -hmm. We're a we're a hub for the strange and unusual and horror. You know, the Venn diagram is, you know, in, in the middle of very large sections. So he he did this film called Coherence, had a very small budget just said, you know what, we're going to hit bullet points. We're going to have a mole in the middle somewhere. So that way, uh, you know, you start getting two out of line. He's going to draw it right back. And it was a very experienced actor and director. So uh, the film turned out great. But when I read in the notes, the, the film is largely improv. Really? It just draws my eyes to it just a little bit more. So I, I kind of respect that. I'm going to, I'm going to have to check this out even pay even more attention to uh, our famed puppeteer. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how, how much uh, he gets out. And uh, I know he does a lot of uh, theater in the uh, den or the Colorado front range area. Um, I, I know he has worked at, um, I think he has worked at meow wolf also, uh, but I could be wrong about that. Um, but yeah, he's uh, he, he, he's awesome. Um, just fab fabulous job. We also have Phyllis Ramey. Now, she has a few horror credits. It's all of them post-production, to my knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, Staycation is one that mm -hmm. uh, stars Olivia Diabo and uh, also has a great Kelly Maroney. I don't know about Mar how big the, the part is for Maroney, but, I mean, that's uh, horror. And Phyllis is in a, a movie with those two? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Staycation is the name of this one. I don't know wow. the size of anyone's role. I only know it's in post-production. Uh, it's more of like a comedy sci-fi horror, but it counts. Okay. It Horror's totally counts. counts. Totally counts. But what led to, to Phyllis joining the cast? Did you see her? She auditioned. Uh, she auditioned. Um, and um, it was pretty, I think there were four four women who uh, who auditioned for that role. And, uh, and uh, she was far and away uh, the best one. Um, She's got and, the experience. Yeah. Plenty and she's it. a total professional too. <laughs> we did we did some you know fairly unpleasant things to her during shooting, and um, uh, and she was a total trooper. Uh, so I I really got to hand it to her. I mean, bravo out of that. You know, lately I've uh, I've gotten more into short films. Uh, there, I mean, there's so many things you can do with them, Travis. I mean, they're fine as standalone projects, but you can also use it to present as a pitch to a feature length premise. Mm -hmm. um, you gradually make them into an anthology um, with today's viewer and their need for instant gratification. Uh, short films are the perfect bite sized project. Uh, what other advantages am I missing? Obviously the budget. Yeah, they can be a lot of things. I mean, they're no, I don't think anybody ever really makes money on a short, uh, but they use it for other things. It's a, it can be a proof of concept, Mm -hmm. um it can be like a pilot or the start of a pilot um you know it can be it like you said it could be expanded and taken as, as a proof of concept to expand into a feature um or it can just be a learning experience for everybody involved so that they can move on and do the next better thing um because resume it's, pattern right it's 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 you know a resume builder and people can uh uh get get their career started that way. Um, which is, that's the approach I'm taking. Um, but uh, that being said, uh, a lot of the comments I got when uh, demon for hire premiered uh, from the audience uh, were, they've kept asking me, well, you, there needs to be more like, when's the sequel? Uh, and that got me thinking, well, um, maybe I've got a pilot here. Maybe the, I've got something, that would be that would fit to screw you're to never going to run out of cases you know travis you're never going to run out of cases oh, angela yeah, totally. lansbury proved that <laughs> yeah totally totally and, uh, and andy griffith uh ben matlock 
prove that. So you're not going to run out of cases. Um, you know, if you get a George Costanza telling you to come up and, you know, do this next episode for LA law, then, you know, you, you know, you've made it. So I, I say, yeah, th- think about it. That's just another one of the utilities of, you know, doing a short film aside from the standalone enjoyment it's going to give. I mean, mm-hmm. so speaking of festivals, Demon for Hire, it's on the festival circuit right now. Where's mm-hmm. it been? Where's it going? Uh, the world premiere was at the HP Lovecraft Film Festival in Portland uh, in early October. Uh, Oregon? In Maine. Portland, Oregon. Yep. Oregon. Uh, and uh, the its next show, its next uh, uh, selection will, will be at the, actually this coming weekend, uh, at the Days of the Dead Film Festival in Chicago. What uh, date is that? Uh, the, I believe this starts on Friday. Um, that would be November 18th to the 20th. And it's, scre- it's screening on Saturday night, uh, November 19th. And is that available only on, on site or do they also have a uh, website for viewing? I don't know if it's going to be virtual too. Uh, I think it's mainly going to be on site, but if you find out otherwise, get me that link and, uh, you know, it's going to be in the episode bio to this episode. Okay. So hang on a second. Sure. Um, do you have any fundraising campaigns going on? I, I know the film is shot already, but sometimes, uh, I don't, uh, I should because going to film festivals is expensive. Um, it is. Um, but, um, I've been too busy with other things, uh, to, sure. to manage a crowdfunding campaign uh, to do that, even though I'm sure it would be like, it would make this process a lot easier. <clears throat> no doubt. No doubt. But yeah, if, if we can find uh, some sort of resource for fans to watch now and they can't make it to uh, a festival like myself. Yeah. So okay. So uh, days of the dead does not appear to be virtual this year. Okay. So, so what was the so, location right, so, on that again? Uh, Chicago. Um, but but also here's a there here's an added benefit. This particular festival has uh, takes place in numerous cities at different times of year. So Demon for Hire will also be screening in Atlanta at the Days of the Dead Film Festival in late January. Chicago to Atlanta, maybe yeah. to Nashville, <laughs> sweeping the Midwest. Well, you know, Nashville's South. not far from Atlanta. No, not at all. Uh, and not that's going to be uh, January 27th to 29th. I think, what, like maybe four hours, something like that? Mm-hmm. Three and a half? I'm about half an hour north of Nashville. So, um, yeah, that that's not an impossibility at all. But, I mean, the, there you have it. We, we've got the – we're probably going to need to put the, the film festival uh, schedule, you know, the, the traveling schedule – in the episode description here. So we're going to do that. We'll get the link from Travis after the fact, and we'll make sure that the the availability is there. Um, So this being a film-based podcast, uh, I'm fully aware. I'd still like to hear about some of your writing, uh, what I've gathered thus far as your stories, or at least your adult writing. Uh, We're going to get into that a little bit later. Um, It's steeped in Japanese culture, especially uh, Senjuku Shadows and the Ronin Trilogy. Uh, can you tell me a little bit about those? Sure. Um, like uh, the Ronin trilogy uh, was my first trilogy, <clears throat> uh, and it's uh, historical fantasy set in 13th century Japan. Um, samurai, ninjas, and demons, and shape shifting critters, and star crossed romance. And, um, and then uh, uh, Shinjuku Shadows is a modern urban day, uh, modern day urban fantasy series uh, set in the same universe. Uh, and uh, uh, so that one's about a ninja, a ninja sorcerer versus the Yakuza. So, and where does the Japanese influence come from? Well, I've always been a huge fan of Japanese culture and history and samurai films and anime and manga and so forth. Um, and uh, to the point that I, when I started writing this book, writing that, writing the Ronin series, excuse me, uh, I ended up moving to Japan and living there for three years. Mm. Um, so I, you know, I studied, studied the language and, and, you know, after that amount of time, uh, I had about a, 
fourth grade reading level, maybe, um, and was conversationally uh, capable. Um, but uh, it's been, what, 15 years since I've been there now, and the, those skills have deteriorated somewhat. Um, As they will. But, um, but yeah, it's a, it's always, I've always loved it. I've always found it fascinating. There's like, if you start reading that history, it is just, there are so many crazy stories of, of, uh, heroism and evil and betrayal and romance and just like, uh, like way more, uh, way, way, way more interesting than anything I could sort of come up, come, come up with on my own. So I love sort of mining stories like that and uh, bringing them to a Western audience. I really would have liked to have seen Japan um, when I was in the Navy. Uh, I got to see a lot of Southeast Asia, but never made it to Japan. Uh, some of my shipmates, um, I, I don't know where they went. But they did see Japan. I never did. Thailand was probably my favorite stop, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. uh, Hong Kong, I didn't get enough time there. And then I, uh, I love Thailand too. A, a buddy and I went on a trip. Where'd you uh, go? To, uh, Thailand, uh, Cambodia, and Vietnam, kind of over the course of a couple three weeks. And and uh, so in Thailand, we we went to uh, uh, Bangkok, of course, uh, Chiang Mai, and uh, uh, Koh Samet. Okay, I, I went to uh, Phuket, and Phuket is more of a, um, well, apparently it's changed uh, mm -hmm. since I've been there. And, of course, things change in a 20-year period because it has been since, like, 2001 that I went there. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was really too young, uh, had, had enough money to, you know, get myself in and out of trouble. And Phuket's but, but probably it, a good place to do that. <laughs> it's a perfect place to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. What do they call the, like, the, 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 is it the, bad moon parties or new moon parties or like, I don't know, something like that. Something but, close probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I wasn't looking for a spiritual awakening. I can tell you that. <laughs> um, I, I did get spiritual, but it was not, uh, I, I still don't feel awakened, yeah. but you know, Phuket was a wonderful place. I do want to go back. I actually told myself, um, I'm going to retire in Thailand mm -hmm. if I can get over two things, my fear of tsunamis, <laughs> And my inability to eat Thai food. I just <laughs> do not like Thai food. I think mm. I would starve to death if I went. Well, uh, in, in, uh, one of the things, speaking of tsunamis, is that when I, I, I went in, what year would it have been? 2005, 2006. Mm, there was like there that. was something in like Indonesia. There, or well, there was, right? the, there was the Indian Ocean tsunami uh, that did tremendous damage to Phuket. Uh, and it was the same one that sort of hit Indonesia really hard. And there were... Uh, you know, thousands and thousands of, of casualties um, sure. all around the Indian Ocean. Uh, and Phuket, uh, w when I was there, Phuket was still basically being rebuilt. Mm. Uh, so, uh, well, yeah, maybe that that's, was one of the reasons I didn't go. That, that could have been, uh, you know, part of the reason for the big changes. Um, what I do hear is that it's kind of turned into, I mean, it was always a touristy place. But I guess like it's more <clears throat> affluent than before. Mm, okay. Um, I guess, you know, in, in comparison to some of the neighboring places and, and what it was before, you know, the rebuild. But gosh, man, Thai, if, if, if our listeners ever get a chance to go to Thailand, it's I amazing. recommend, yeah, Phuket and any of the, uh, the, the beach cities. Perfect. But gosh, I, I, I keep telling myself that I want to go and, you know, do as the Romans do, as they say, right? I want to live like the locals. I don't know if I really want to do that, but I mean, I could see living on a farm, living out my days with a, you know, like mid twenties. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> never mind. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about it after. Uh, <laughs> but you know, listen, real quick. I, I have to know. This is just for for personal me. This is this isn't for you, listeners. It's for me. Give me the rundown of Deathwind because it's labeled as a, a Western horror. And I don't think we have enough of those. I need more yeah. Western horrors. Yeah, that's, that is a, uh, uh, is a Lovecraftian horror Western. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a uh, Cowboys, Cannibals and Cosmic Horror. That's what, mm. uh, that's, I that love novel. good alliteration. 
I love some good alliteration. Listen, like cosmic horror, I think is misunderstood sometimes. And tell me if I'm given a proper explanation here. When I, when I explain cosmic horror, I think people think, you know, the cosmos. So it's otherworldly, mm-hmm. but it's not otherworldly. It's something hidden within this world that we never knew was there until some sort of event provides an awakening. W- w- would you say that's yeah, that's you're, accurate? You're, you're, yeah, you're you're on the you're on the mark there. Um, all I th- all horror is based on some sort of reveal, right? That there's sure. something hidden that's that's going to cause trouble. That's sort of the basic kernel of what a horror story is. Um, uh, and in the case of cosmic horror, it is otherworldly. Um, th- sort of the central idea is the in- is based in the the insignificance of Earth in the cosmos and our place in it. So there are these you know um, incredible entities uh, of vast uh, power and like incredible age that may be only vaguely aware of us, except maybe as an hors d'oeuvre. Um, and, um, and, and what can we possibly do against that sort of thing? Right. Um, that sort of power force, whatever. Um, um, you know, to contrast that with something like in uh, Western mythology, like a vampire or a werewolf, right. Which sure. have, which have, safety nets associated with them right garlic sunlight holy water whatever it is you can kill that vampire right there's there's something a vampire is scary but you know you have you have weapons that can be used against and same with werewolves right you can still maybe kill a werewolf with several silver bullets and and so on in cosmic horror there ain't no such thing it's um the best you can sort of hope for is to die in your sleep. <laughs> to die, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and not screaming, right? So correct. Uh, that's the idea. I love it, man. I love it. Well, where can readers find uh f- find your work? Uh pretty much everywhere. My my uh my website is travishearman.com. Uh and uh there are pages on there for how to find all my books, but I mean, you know, wherever you buy books, uh whether it's if you buy your ebooks on Amazon or uh, other retailers, uh, you can find them, uh, print copies are easily, they won't be stocked in any bookstore, but the, they will be easily or, uh, orderable. You can, you can get them. So, uh, my stuff's pretty easy to find if you look. Well, before we get out of here, do you want to tell everybody where they can find you on the socials? Um, well, with all what's going on with Twitter at the moment, I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to be there. Um, but for now, I'm there uh, at I'm just my name. Uh, uh, at I'm Travis also, Herman? Yeah, at Travis Herman. Oh, easy um, enough. And uh, I'm on Instagram, but I don't really do much over there. Um, yet. Uh, yeah, yet. Um, maybe that will change if Twitter goes away. Um, uh, and I'm mainly on Facebook as far as social media goes. Um I have a group, uh, a Facebook group that's specifically about my writing and sort of community building. Uh, and that's called uh, uh, Reader, Readers, Ren- Ronin Renegade, Renegades and Readers. Uh, so uh, that's a good place to find me. We'll link that in the bio as well. But my man, I want to thank you very much for giving me some of your time. Uh, I'm I'm definitely thank looking for forward to Demon for Hire. Okay. And I, thank I you. hope uh, in the upcoming film festivals you knock them dead and listeners viewers check out the episode bio for links to travis Herman's work and make sure you're checking out our other shows from the slasher sports crew via the link tree in the episode bio but until then i hope that you all may drink the blood of your enemies from the skulls of their children